it's time to do another Nian video. And I guarantee this Nian video is not going to be like any other one on YouTube because it's very unusual indeed. So let's start with this tube. This tube is quite unusual and it's actually three dimensional. It's an ornamental tube and it was custom made for me at a place called the Nian Workshop in Glasgow, which it, it's no longer in existence now. And they had a Nian bender there called Nori who made me up a load of custom tubes because I went through a real neon spell for a while. And this particular one is based on argon and mercury. You can see the slight blue glow at the bottom here of the gas inside. And it's actually using what's called noviol glass, a natural yellow glass, very consistent yellow. And it's got a pink phosphor inside it. You can see a slight bit of, well you may not actually see a slight hint of pink here and there. It's maybe only visible to the naked eye. And what's really interesting about this is that it's being driven by, and I'll just turn the light on now, a voltage multiplier in one of my own bases. And the nice thing about the voltage multiplier circuits is that um, you can repair them to component level. There are no fancy wound components, no special high voltage stuff as such. Um, it's just a very easy to repair. So, and taking a look at this, you can see the blue in here. Now, the circuitry I'm using is not suitable for driving actual neon tubes. It tries, it manages to light them, but um, after a while they'll start flash on and off because um, it, it's kind of the, it's super simple, it's not super mega high voltage, and uh, the traditional argon gas with a bit of mercury in them to create a mercury vapour to give the blue that then excites the phosphors, the, or sorry, the ultraviolet that excites the phosphors, that's one of the easiest gases to drive in neon tubes. I suppose, technically speaking, it should be called an argon mercury tube, but everybody just says neon tube because ultimately that's the image you get. So here's the uh, circuit I'm driving this with. Oh, actually, you know what? I shall show you one of my other power supplies. So I'll just unplug this at the moment, showing the raw yellowness of the glass. And my other power supply, if I can now find it, here it is. Looks like this. It's based on a box that came from Maplin. The only difference between this one and some others I made is that the other ones had a nice little um, sleeve coming out, a sort of strain relief, but um, I couldn't find any. I've kind of run out of them. So I'm not going to plug this in quite yet until I've got a tube connected. I I'll actually plug a neon tube into it. So here's an argon tube and here's a neon tube, and I shall connect the electrodes to a neon tube and then plug it in. Doesn't really matter which way around they go. Although, it is actually running the tube at DC, which is quite odd. That's why they're red and black. So I'll plug that in, and the tube lights, lights quite brightly I have to say, but after a while of running it'll start sort of cutting out and then it'll, after it cools down it'll strike again, then it'll cut out, and it's not ideal, it's a shame really, because it would have been nice to be able to drive a couple of feet of neon off this power supply, particularly given how simple it is. But if I unplug it, and I connect these, I shall touch them together, just in case there's a little bit of charge left, because it is a voltage multiplier. Um, giving all the little tidbits of information for those people who are wanting to actually guess what's inside that box. So here it is with our uh, argon mercury tube with um, the blue phosphor. It's interesting to note you can see the glow of the mercury vapour in the argon, in the clear gas, but then when it gets the phosphor, because it's converting the invisible ultraviolet light to visible light, it makes it look a lot brighter. And initially when you connect these tubes to this type of circuit, it does just shimmer just a tiny little bit, the tube, um, and it can be quite a bit sort of like, well quite shimmery indeed at the beginning, but it seems to settle down, but there's always that tiny bit of shimmer, it just drives the gas in a different way, but it works quite well. Another notable thing is the positive electrode makes the positive, um, well the positive wire makes the positive electrode in here heat up, but the negative electrode stays stone cold. Um, all interesting characteristics. There's also um, an issue that the mercury gradually migrates from the positive end, and when you've run it for literally years, it migrates 
progressively across until that end starts going dark and purpley with just the raw argon gas because the mercury has been migrated away completely. And the way to fix that is either to reverse the leads and then it will start migrating back. Or because old, um, old school neon tubes had a good blob of mercury in them, you can actually shake the blob of mercury around back to the beginning again. And this allows for another really interesting visual effect. I've got another tube which is currently in Glasgow and it's shaped like an M with a dip in the middle and it's deliberately designed to trap the mercury at that dip. So as it migrates round and it takes, honestly, it takes years before the effect actually happens, it's filled with neon gas and the mercury and the uh, discharge gradually changes colour. It goes to raw neon um, on the side, on the positive side hits the mercury and then it makes a transition at that point into the blue because the uh, mercury has been carried across in one direction but stuck at that point and that's the point that the mercury uh, becomes the dominance at a wavelength and stimulates the, the, well, in the case of that tube it's a clear glass tube so it basically goes from red to blue. It's quite interesting, an unusual tube but not, not easy to actually, you can't, don't just plug it in and you get the effect instantly, it just it gradually happens. So let's uh, take a look inside that power supply, I shall unplug it. And I shall put these tubes out of the way before I break them because it's so hard getting neon now. Particularly anything special, it's just not so easy to get. Uh, the place I used to get them, neon workshops in Glasgow, it was a chap called Nori used to make my tubes up for me. And it was always really fun visiting because... There's a chap there called Donald, and Donald was an old-timer in the Glasgow neon industry, and he worked for a company called Franco Signs. Now, Franco Signs was the young electric sign co, like Yesco, of Las Vegas, but of Glasgow, and it's in back in the days when Glasgow was full of spectacular signage, and... Um, it, the company, he used to tell me stories about the company, just give me, describe the signs and the technology and the people that worked there. And it was just fascinating. I just really enjoyed that. And there's also a guy there called Blackie. Um, and all I know of his name is Blackie. That's just how I would refer to him. And he wrote a significant um, work on neon signage. But um, all very interesting. But what's in the box? It's a very simple voltage multiplier. And I will draw you the schematic for this right now. It's got two electrolytics at the bottom. Actually, here, I'll just draw it out. That's the best bet, isn't it? And then I'll show you the back of the circuit board so you can copy it if you want, just for fun. It's not really what I'd call a ideal for commercial applications, but for personal high-voltage experimenters, it's really, really good. So the circuit looks like this, um, he says, trying to remember how it goes. So there's two voltage multipliers, the positive voltage multiplier on the left there and the negative one on the right. And the reason for the two voltage multipliers is it's just easier to generate high voltage at high current when you just use two separate sections. Um, there's less losses. So it starts off with an electrolytic capacitor. In the case of this, I used one megafarad at 450 volt because I could get them at that time. There's also a discharge resistor, one mega ohm discharge resistor. Ideally there'd be two, but I just use one because hi, it does. And the point of the one mega ohm discharge resistor is to A, discharge it so you don't get a zap off the leads, but also when you turn these off, because uh, the neon tubes will emit light um, even at very low current, what happens is you turn it off and the tube, instead of just going out, it just gently shimmers away and it stays lit for ages. And latterly I made some animated versions of these that flashed on and off or chased. Even uh, built a custom add-on for my fairground light control system that could chase um, blocks of four channels. Um, and uh, it was really helpful there, making sure the tubes went out quickly instead of, sort of flickering. So this is live. Um, and uh, let's uh, there's neutral, but neutral goes through a 100 ohm resistor just to limit in rush current. Neutral. Um, I'll draw one side first. So let me think and try to remember here. Yep, a diode goes up like that, and on the other side, we've got the opposite polarity. So the diode actually 
points down the wrong, on the opposite direction. So this capacitor here will be charged up to um, about 330 volts off mains 240 volts. This may, means this circuit is not ideal for use in America, but um, having said that, it's okay for use in Europe. And you could use a small transformer. It's quite low power. It's only about 5 or 10 watts or something like that. It's really not much. So you could use a small step-up transformer to drive it. So um, here's the other discharge resistor. So at this point, these uh, are the, the this is the main bit of the power supply. This is what supplies the modestly high voltage to run the tube. And if you add the two voltages together, it comes out about just over 600 volts. But if you just stuck the tube across that, firstly, the tube would hopefully not light because it requires a much higher voltage to strike the tube, but much less to run it. If it did strike, um, then it probably, it would just dump the charge in these capacitors. There's no current limiting and it could actually even damage diodes and stuff like that. I'm not 100% sure. It's not something I really want to try. But uh, we have to strike the tubes and to do that we have to add on voltage multiplier sections. So we add on some capacitors. Uh, I'm trying to remember how many stages it was here. But these capacitors, they only have to be little capacitors. I think I used 10 nanofarad at 630 volts, like ionizer type capacitors. And on the positive side, all the diodes point towards the tip. On the negative side, um, let's draw this up. Um, On the negative side, all the diodes point towards uh, the power supply, they point down. Now what happens is that when the circuit is powered up, it shuffles the voltage up, and the voltage quite quickly, just in a few main cycles, rises up. Uh, by uh, There's going to be about ooh, 600 or so volts across these capacitors, each one, so you've got to get a... a couple of thousand maybe out the end, and that will strike the tube, but you need current limiting, and that's where it just comes down to resistors. And that's these two resistors here, these two big chunky resistors, and it might seem a bit inefficient, but in reality they don't actually dissipate too much power, they're slightly oversized. Um, if the tube's the correct size, if you use too short a tube it can smoke those resistors, but as long as you use two foot or so of a 12 millimeter uh, argon mercury, then they're absolutely fine, and they are 4K7, and I use 2 watt resistors, 4K7, 2 watt. Uh, the, all the capacitors are 10 nano in that area, and the diodes are 1N4007. And that's the high voltage there, uh, the positive and the negative, current limited and that is the circuit. Isn't that just breathtakingly simple? And you can just, you know, if a component failed, and I have never ever had one of these fail, other than the output resistors, when I, I tried driving a fluorescent tube with it, that's not a good idea, because they've got a very low voltage across them, and it did smoke the resistors. But if we're neon tubes, I've just never had a component fail. And the circuitry, I'll show you the back of it, is very symmetrical. It's uh, very, very simple. I'll hold this up. You can take a snapshot if you want of that. And then I'll flip it over, and that's what it looks like on the other side, for reference. But, uh, yeah, it's it's really neat. And I went a step further with these. Um, I made some bases up, which was basically a plastic box, project box, with rubber feet in the bottom. And uh, I used two plastic conduit... Uh, I was going to say bushes, but um, what is the correct term for them now? Couplers? It's not couplings, it's a... Uh, oh, blimey. I'm an electrician as well, and I've kind of forgotten what I'd even call these. Adapters? Yeah, male, male bushes, male couplers. I don't know, I can't remember what I call them now. Not really ordered many in recently. And on these, I put a circuit board inside that's slotted into the slots, and this is a beefed up version. This uses um, two electrolytics in 
series, and then it uses a one microfarad, I think it is, uh, 400 volt capacitor as the first stage, and then the electrolytics to boost that up higher, and then the, the strike uh, capacitors. Not really 100% needed, but um, the, the design had the two output pads with bits of wire on them, uh, and also holes for uh, tie wraps, and you basically slotted this into the board, into the uh, case, like this. You put the tube in, you had the tie wraps primed, you gently tie wrap the electrodes, and then just twisted the leads onto these wires and put the lid back on and that was you had a little knee and base. I had just loads of these around the house for a long time and I've still got them dotted about left, right and centre but mostly sitting in the attic waiting for reuse just because I don't want to... Uh, I had to... Uh, my mother used to come over here a lot and she's got dementia so um, I used to... I couldn't have anything breakable out because she'd just try and pick things up and stuff them in a bag. So that kind of dictated what could be put out. Um, it's worth noting that uh, the high voltages also reference directly to the mains and as a friend in Holland who does Nian, uh, Dirk Boonstra put it, touching these, either of them, will literally blow the hair out of your head. It gives you quite a wallop. I've never actually had that experience. I have footed about with the leads and put them on. You think, that's not clever because all it takes is... Um, this is a test lead cable. It's not proper high voltage cable. They'll probably rated well enough for the sort of voltages this is like to see. But if you consider that if the insulation breaks down and the high voltage sparks through, it creates a, a, a conductive path and that could give you quite a, a wallop. But um, as I say, it's never happened, but I wouldn't rule it out. So uh, just uh, take precautions. And it's always a good idea if you've uh, used it just to... Um, just short them out after uh, after you've unplugged it just to make sure it's completely dead but this um yeah this drives uh two or three feet of argon mercury tubing and uh, it's a great effect i'm trying to think is there anything else that i could really cover this i can mention that you'll find this project um on my website bigclive.com if you want to uh, i mean ultimately this is the schematic here it's pretty much the same schematic but um yeah, no circuit boards. I really should re—I should revisit that someday because although I made these circuit boards, it was on an old DOS-based printed circuit board package, and uh, I really need to move it on to. I need to redesign those uh, on my newer package. But yeah, very simple uh, and a great way to get a bit of neon around the house.